As you can see, I can't, how are you? there's quite a lineup over there, um, or quite a row. We appreciate our deacons. This is Meet Your Deacon Day. I hope that you've gotten a chance to get a directory. If you look on the cover of the directory, you'll see this is our youth group, and uh, this is one of, uh, you have to talk to Paul about what they were doing. That they were doing. What a great youth group, and we were glad to put them on the cover. And they are always most interesting. Right, Turner? Yeah. Right, exactly. If you're our guest today, we hope that you'll feel at home and a part of all that we do here at McGill. If you look on the back of your bulletin, there are several announcements that we have this morning. First of all, as I said, welcome. Judy Jones is our deacon of the week. She'll be reading the Old Testament scripture lesson from Numbers. It's a really interesting passage. Let's go straight to uh, blood. Donna, you want to go to blood? <laughs> I just wanted to remind you that our blood drive is tomorrow night, 4 until 7 o'clock. Here at the church, it'll be in Bruce's Sunday school class and right beside of the kitchen. And uh, you can sign up at the back table, but if you don't sign up, you can still come and give blood. We, we, they still accept it. And um, again, it's from 4 to 7 tomorrow night. I also wanted to remind you about the crop walk. Be sure the, that you uh, sign up for the crop walk if, you can, uh, if you're able to walk or run. <laughs> if you're able to walk or run, there's a one-mile trek and a three-mile trek. So you can choose whichever one you want to do. And uh, we have the papers for you to sign up to get donate to get people to support you so that uh, you can turn in a donation to the crop walk for the food that goes to feed the people. So uh, they're, they're back there on the back table as well. And just be sure that I get you to sign so that uh, Robert will know who's got which piece of paper. <laughs> Anything else? You've already mentioned the deacon people there. so. And I'm supposed to be over here helping people find your deacon if you don't know who, that, who it is. <laughs> but I'm usually over here at the crop walk table so, my papers do, so Robert's papers don't walk off. So if you need to know who your deacon is, you can come over there or some, one of the deacons can help you because they can look it up too. Thank you. You see how well the chair of our diaconate at multitask. <laughs> Thank you. As many of you know, I just got, I got back from Princeton yesterday, and it was a wonderful trip. I appreciated the opportunity of being up there. It was a 590-mile trip. The, uh, coming out of Philadelphia, I looked in my rearview mirror, and there was eight or ten police cars with all the lights flashing following me. I just got ahead of the mayor coming to meet the Pope <laughs> at the Air Force. I was thankful. <laughs> but of all that trip, you know the worst part of the road? Right here when we got into Cabarrus County. <laughs> once, I got to, once I got to Cabarrus County, uh, once I got to 85 over there, I, I got stuck for I don't know how long. Just waiting and waiting and waiting. I said, ah. But, but it, was, it was a great trip. Reminded me that when I was at Princeton as a student, I told one of my friends, I said, you know, I'm from North Carolina. And North Carolina is God's country. He looked at me and said, yeah, he's the only one to live there too, right? <laughs> but it's good to be back home. Um, it reminded me of the crop walk, uh, as, as Donna alluded to. Uh, I'm going to make it a crop run. So if anybody wants to run with me, we're going to run the three miles, and then we're going to do the one mile. So that makes a nice four-mile run, about a 6K, 6.5K. So. But don't run with Paul, he's too fast. Run with me, I'm slow. But we, we'll have fun together, it's a great time. Children Council will meet Wednesday at 6, so will be a part of that. The Marys and Marthas will meet on October the 8th at 6.30. You're going to bring that up. Tracy, our parish nurse, is going to double, double dip. Part of the reason is because we're going to do, whenever we have the meeting on October the 8th, um, it's a potluck supper, and we're going to ask you to sign up for some, for whatever you want to bring. But while we're doing that, we're going to be making these blankets, and Jordan made a sample of this blanket. Um, it's a prayer blanket. And what we're going to do with these prayer blankets is we're going to take them out to our shut-ins. Um, and we're going to make these blankets 
say a prayer with them, um, and there's a little verse that goes with them, and we're going to then we're going to take these out to our shut-ins, and it's a really nice ministry that we have that we want to provide for our people. Um, so if you can join us, please come out on Thursday, October the 8th at 6:30. We'll have a nice uh, potluck supper. We'll have some fellowship, make these power, power prayer blankets, and then we'll get them out to our shut-ins. Thank you. Do you want to say anything about the uh, mammography unit, the success? Yeah, we had a wonderful, I don't know what the total numbers are, but we had a wonderful um, ma uh, ma mobile mammography um, thing. Um, I want to thank everybody who got their mammograms on then. Um, if you hadn't, you can always call the hospital and get one scheduled because um, we want to make that, a, we want to make sure everybody gets those. I told the preacher this morning I was working on something for men in November and he said, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> she said we could grow a beard. I'll take that. All right, crop walk we've done. Uh, if you need offering envelopes, please see Patsy. Uh, we need help in the nursery, see Jordan and Melinda. We are so glad that you are here this day. You are not, uh, it's raining. Uh, I, I'm sure you figured that out by now. I said, usually in a Baptist church, it takes three or four feet of water to get you in. Oh, wait, I knew it. You want me to do the rain thing first? All right. Takes three or four feet of rain to get you in, water to get you in, six raindrops and one snowflake to keep you out. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Jamie had a wonderful group last night at UNCC for the first uh, Under the Lights game. So we had 35 last night, which was wonderful. Um, we had a lot of new people, so thank you for everybody who came out, um, especially the new People hope we didn't scare you away. We had a really good time. The bus was actually full minus one seat. That's the most people we've had on the bus, so that was wonderful. Um, and we had so much fun. We're doing it again Friday night. So um, I know there's a lot of transportation issues because the bus is going to leave at 3.30, which is a Friday, and people are working. Um, but if we need to set up some carpools and figure out how to get people there with parking passes, we can do that. Just let me know if you're going to need a parking pass as soon as you know, I just have to request those. And we look forward to seeing you guys there and seeing new faces this time. Thanks. That'll be the first Friday night game ever at UNCC. So come on out and help us do the concession stand there. Paul and Donna celebrated an anniversary, a wedding anniversary yesterday, so congratulate them. Keep Donna in your prayers. We're glad you all are here today. Let's stand and greet each other.
if you'll join me this morning in reading responsively our call to worship. We have walked with you, O God, from many parts of the world to this time and place. And we will walk with you, O God, into the world to serve all people. We leave behind old securities. We leave behind our reliance on worldly goods. And we will walk with you, O God, into the world to live all people. We leave behind all which holds us back. We leave behind all which keeps us from following you. And we will all with you, O God, into the world to work with all people. We leave behind the fears which bind us. We leave behind the hurts, hurts which damage us. And we will all with you, O God, into the peace you offer to all people. Amen. May we join now in singing hymn number 161, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Let's stand please as we sing hymn 161. Morning. Good morning. I'm extra glad to be here today. Um, been away for a while. We're living at Myrtle Beach right now until we have a permanent home here in Concord built. So every chance I get to come home, it's good to see all of you. This morning I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, Numbers 11, 4 through 6, 10 through 16, and 24 through 29. 
The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them, that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a suckling child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you're going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting, and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered seventy elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put the Spirit on them. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you that you have brought each of us safely to this place today. We surrender our lives to you in worship and in praise. As we gather, we remember those who are not with us today for all the reasons that they may have. If there be sickness, we pray that you will have healing upon them. We pray that you would give mercy to those who are in trouble and do not know the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you walk with us every day, no matter what our challenges are. We invite you, the Holy Spirit, the beautiful Holy Spirit, to come to us today in this service of worship and dwell in our hearts and open them to receive the message being brought to us. Challenge us to take it out to the rest of the world. Comfort us and inspire us to learn more about your majestic ways. And send us from this place as your messengers, that we may be prophets and prophesy for you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our children will come forward. Donna will meet them on the steps.
glad y'all came forward. I thought there for a minute I was going to be the only one. <laughs> in the text, in the scripture passage that the pastor is going to read in a few minutes, Jesus makes a statement. He says, salt is good. We know that, don't we? Sometimes if we put too much, it's not real good for us. But it sure does make food taste better. There's nothing that tastes any better than a tomato that you get out of the garden and you put it on the bread and make a tomato sandwich and put a little dab of salt on there and it tastes so good. Salt is good for, is good. It has a job and that is to make food taste better. Did you know that sometimes people will take a little pinch of salt and put it in a cookie recipe as they're mixing it up? And it actually makes the cookie a little sweeter because it takes out the bitterness that some of that the sugar can give it sometimes. And so some cookie recipes even call for a little pinch of salt that makes the cookie sweeter. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But I bet there might be something that you don't know about salt. Did you know? that salt is used in 14,000 products that are made. Like, for example, salt is used in the, fixes the uh, color in dye. Like when, like you've got on a brightly colored shirt and she has on like pink and uh, mine's brown, hers is blue. Salt was put in the dye that was used to make the, the, the uh, designs on those shirts to fix it there so that it wouldn't fade as quickly so that this didn't become pink and then the next time I washed it it's almost white okay it fixes the the color in the uh, in the fabric salt is also used to make leather if you have on a pair of leather shoes or if you have a leather wallet in your back pocket or if you have a leather belt on, salt was used in the making of that leather. And then salt's also used in, in the chemical industry to make plastics. The chair you were sitting on before you came up here, salt was used to make that plastic. The little plastic toys that you play with sometimes, they, were, they have salt is used to make those plastic toys. So it is an important uh, spice, it's an important ingredient in a lot of products. And it's no wonder that Jesus said in the, in the text today, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. I think that salt that we have in us that Jesus was talking about is, is letting us know that we're supposed to go out and flavor the world with God's love. And then let God use us to make this world a better place to live. And that's what Christians are here and why, why we're here and what we're all about is to share God's love with others so the world can be a better place. Would you pray with me? Would you pray after me? Dear Jesus, help us to flavor our world. with love you share with us. Help us to allow you to use us to make the world a better place. We love you. Amen. Thank you. Biscuit recipe. You it's all, yeah. <laughs> I might have to try that. The church is one foundation. Let's all stand and sing. This is our offertory hymn, hymn number 350. Would you stand, please?
Let us pray. God, we thank you for this day. We come to you today with grateful hearts, grateful for McGill Baptist Church, for our church staff and leaders, and for our church family. We're especially thankful for the freedom to be able to come together and worship you as a community of believers. And now at this time, we bring to you our tithes and our offerings. We ask you to bless them and multiply them for the benefit of your kingdom. Be with us each day and help all that we do and think and say, bring honor and glory to your holy name. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
beautiful. Thank you so much. One of the conf- one of the workshops I went to at, at Princeton this week was seeing the creation. And I went to it because it said that you did not have to sing or carry a tune. I said, that's a good thing because Steve told me I could sing tenor, 10 or 12 miles away. <laughs> we were sitting there, and it really was a wonderful, uh, we're talking about all the hy- hymns and music written about the creation and the soil and everything. And uh, I looked at the guy beside me and said, you know, this is the first time uh, I never made it to this building, uh, the music building, when, when I was at school here. He said, probably not. It wasn't built when you were here. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Our New Testament lesson comes from Mark. Mark 9, verses 38 through 50, and indeed is our custom. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said to him, them, Do not stop them, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble... Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life main to have two hands to go or to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eyes cause you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into Gehenna, hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace one with another. May God add his blessing to the hearing and the reading of his word. And in the hearing of that word, may we have the opportunity to think about that word. And in thinking about that word, may that word ease itself into our hearts, our minds, and who we are. May we sense the truth of it and find in it what it is that we need to do with our very lives. May we pray. Our Father, we thank you this day that we can come to you. We come rejoicing. We thank you for the gentle rain that is falling upon a parched earth. We thank you for the goodness of your creation. We thank you for the good earth. Forgive us from when we have abused it. Forgive us when we have taken advantage of it. Forgive us when we have forgotten that it is yours as we are yours. And in these moments, this day, we come together with many cares, many burdens, many concerns, many sorrows. We remember those who are sick. We lift them up to you. We remember those who will be having surgeries this week. We lift Sir Richie to you. We thank you for her. We are thankful for the surgeons that will be there. We're thankful for all the good physicians. And we remember that you are the great physician. We remember a world that is full of turmoil and war and hate and greed and strife. But in that world, you have placed us. And you have beckoned us, you have called us, you have told us that we are to be peacemakers. Help us to do what it is that we can do in the world in which you have placed us. 
We remember even now in this place how you taught us to pray. And we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The saying goes, it's, on some days you can't please everyone, and on some days you can't please anyone. Listen to the passage that Judy read so well to us earlier. Remember the context of it. The people had been serving in slavery. They had been serving a Pharaoh who was not benevolent. And the backs of the pyramids, the backs of the cities, the backs of all that were being built upon them. And Moses comes and he, he goes to the very steps of the Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And you know the story. And, and they have gained their freedom. They are marching into a wilderness. And they're discovering that this freedom may not be all it's cracked up to be. And I love the way the writer says it. The rabble among them said, oh, we miss our cucumbers. We miss our leeks. We miss all of these things. And here we're in the wilderness, and what do we have? We have manna. What is it? For God has provided them this manna, this manna that is really some kind of sticky, webbery, spidery kind of thing that, grow, that is in the trees. It comes and they gather it and they eat it and it's something like, if we understand the Hebrew just a little bit, it's like a honey graham cracker. Maybe or maybe not. Whatever it is, they say, what is it? And they say, this is what we got. We need meat. Where's our meat? You know, the, the name of this conference they went to is called Just Food. Ooh, I should have read that a little more carefully. Guess what kind of food we had? Vegetarian. I've never eaten so many sweet potatoes in all my life. And I like sweet potatoes. Mushrooms and this and that. And, and then finally, on the last night, we, uh, we had gone to the farm in there, in the 20-acre farm that Princeton's uh, uh, teaching their kids, and their kids. I didn't know seminary students could be so young. Uh, teaching that to, to get in touch with the soil, get in touch with the good earth, to get in touch and to grow and see uh, what that's all about. And finally, they brought a food truck out. It's a Methodist church had a food truck that they were doing. And um, they had the, the vegetarian entry. And then they had, uh, you have to be from New Jersey to understand uh, this, where, where did it go? This uh, analogy. They had Taylor pork roll, which is uh, glorified spam. Uh, and they had the, the pork roll and the fried egg and, and something else on it. And then they had the urban cowboy. Pulled pork, fried egg. Uh, it's actually very good. That's what I got. Uh, then they had a bacon and egg and cheese uh, sandwich. All, of, uh, all, the, all the places where meat got gone first. <laughs> they were complaining that they didn't have any meat. And how it would be better because they got the cucumbers for free. They got the fish from free from their taskmasters. And then Moses said to the Lord, oh, what am I going to do? And Moses complains to God. It's all right to complain to God. God can take it. God's bigger than our complaints. <laughs> Moses said, Lord, why did you give me these people? You're the one that promised to deliver them. You're the one that made the promise to send them to this thing that was promised to their ancestors. And now I've got them, and they want to be fed. What do you want me to do with them? God says, well, gather together 70 of the elders. Get them together. He said, and they did the Spirit moved among them. The Spirit was indwelled in each of them. And that sounds really good. 
But then there were two people that didn't quite, <laughs> they're like me, a day late and a dollar short. They were outside the building. They were outside the tent. When my ship comes in, I'll be at the airport. But still, the Spirit came to them. And they started speaking with the authority and everything. But some people said, wait, that's not right. That's not right. They can't do this. And they said, some people are speaking out here. And they brought them to Moses and Joshua, son of Nun. I love that, son of Nun. Don't let, and really, I think it's more like this, not my Lord Moses. My Lord Moses, what are you doing? Why are you letting them do that? That can't be. They're not, do you remember uh, old brother Arthur? They aren't bona fide. This cannot be. Fast forward. Jesus, remember from last week, Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. Jesus is telling his disciples some of the most important things in the world that matter. Jesus is trying to make sure they know their priorities. They understand what's happening. They understand these things. And they're worried about who's the greatest. And now they come to him. John comes to him and says, there's this guy out there who is casting out demons and he's doing these things and he's doing it in your name. This cannot be. We cannot allow it. He is not bona fide. He has no credentials. Who does he think he is? And then Jesus. Jesus understands so fully how his disciples are not getting it. And he says, anyone who does something in my name, if he's not against us, he's for us. If he's doing something in my name, that's good. And then he says, he says in some of the strongest language that he will use, if anyone will keep the little ones, we talked last week about that passage, and it was somewhat about a child. But the little one bears much more meaning than that. And the meaning that it does bear will explain a little bit more about what follows. Little ones is a euphemism for those that have little voice. Little ones is a euphemism for the widows. It is a euphemism for the lame. It is a euphemism for the blind. It is the euphemism that somehow in life has treated them such that they are handicapped for whatever reason in whatever way. And Jesus says anyone that would keep one of the little ones, anyone who would keep those away from me, it is better for them to have a millstone put around their neck and tossed into the sea. That's not how they teach swimming at the Y. You sink. And then he says, let them cut off your hand, let them pluck your eye out, let them chop your foot off. He's using Arabic exaggeration for sure. The sad part about the scripture is too often, even in our society, in our culture, I remember even the time when I was a student at Princeton, there was this university student who was at the hospital because he had read this and he had chopped part of his hand off. That's not what the scripture means. I can tell you that for sure. He says it is better to do that than go into Gehenna. Gehenna hell. Gehenna is the valley right outside of Jerusalem. It is the place where Jeremiah would remind us that the, Babel, the, uh, the deity of the Palestinians were, where they sacrificed children. It is the most abhorrent place in the kingdom and the memory lives on. 
It is a place so bad that all they could do with that land is they remember that where the child, their own children were sacrificed. They just throw their garbage to it. It is a place where the Romans would take the bodies from the resurrection, from the crucifixion. And there they would burn them. It is an abomination. It is an abhorrence. It is a horrible place. It is a place of nothingness, a place of meaningless. It is a place. He says it is better. For you who think you know everything, it is better for you to understand. Because if you think about what it would be without a hand, if you think about what it would be without an eye, if you think about what it would be a foot, then you would understand the little ones. Then you would understand something of what it means to be in the kingdom of God. Then you would give them a voice, and you would be even more than giving the voice. You would raise your voice with them. And you would understand the things that are truly important. And here, you're worried about who is one of us. You're worried about who is going to speak in my name. You're wondering about your credentials. You're wondering about this. And it's sort of interesting because this happens it happens when the disciples remember that Jesus had went up to the mountain and came back, and they could not heal a man with possession, that was possessed. And yet here is this person who has done that and more. And it bothers them. Envy will always bother you. And when you're envious, what do you do? You have to make yourself better. You have to start shutting others out because you are better. And this is the sin of the church. This is the sin of the church when the church thinks it is a citadel, when the church thinks it is a fortress, when the church builds all the walls up to protect itself from the world. This is the opposite of what Jesus wants his people to do. We are not gatekeepers. We are not wall builders. It is not what separates us that matters. It is what brings us together. It is what makes us uniquely aware that we are all God's children. We're all his creation. And we need to take care of each other. The little ones and the great ones and everyone else in between. And they all have a place. There is no one who can keep anyone out of God's kingdom. That is not our task. That is not our purpose. That is not what we do. Our task and purpose is simple and clear and clean. Open our hearts, open our lives, open our places to all. This is what it means. And he says, then you're the salt. The salt is also used for sacrifice, although I think it would work in your biscuits. Because your biscuits are sacrificial. (laughs) The salt of the meat of every meat that comes into The temple is salted before it is roasted. And it brings it out. And he says, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, it's no good. And he says, if God's people have lost their willingness to be a season, to be a flavor, to be open to God's spirit, we're no good. We have to open ourselves up to all the little ones. If not, it is better than a millstone around our neck. And our lives is wasted in Gehenna. What an abhorrent place. But as we know our saltiness, when we know what it is that we can do and will do and must do, then we will have the peace. The peace of God. And we will share the peace. That's the passing of the peace. That is the blessing of the peace. That is the purpose of the church. I'm thankful that you as a people live up to the calling 
that God has for you as a church. May we always continue to do so. May we pray. Our Father, we come into this place knowing that you have made each and every one of us Knowing too often in our lives we build barriers, we build walls. We do everything we can to separate ourselves. But you have called us in the opposite direction. You have called us to tear down the hostilities. You have called us to tear down the things that keep us apart. You have called us to be one. One in your love, one in your spirit, one in your presence. You have called us not to keep out, but to bring in. You've called us not to shut our fists, but to open our arms. You've called us not to close our minds, but to open them. You have called us to be your children. Oh Lord, may we know it, may we believe it, and may we live it. In your name we do pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is hymn number 346. He has the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. And when we remember that, we remember who we are and our place in it. And we remember what it is that we need to do. And our invitation is that we would live up to that calling. Our invitation is that you would come and be a part of our family here at McGill. Our invitation is that you would know that Jesus Christ is the Lord. However God would lead you, we invite you to respond as we stand, as we sing. One thing that we do, you, you finish meeting your deacon, make sure you get your directory, but we also need to receive the nominating report. The nominating committee report is in the directory, and those are the people that will be serving us in this year. It does not need a motion before us. It is informus because it comes from a committee. Lori Anderson is the chair of that committee. So that is before you. It needs not a second. It just needs your approval. So we can let those people serve. All in favor will say aye. Suppose no, of course. Uh, uh, we, we, now, now we're bona fide. <laughs> we're so glad. We hope that uh, if you are visiting us with this day that you felt at home and a part of all that we do. Uh, Phil Herndon's birthday was yesterday. He's getting to be an old man, so you might want to tell him happy birthday yesterday. So, any other birthdays? Everybody good? Any other announcements? Indeed, he has the whole world in his hands. He has you, and he has me. He has our neighbor. May we go and find our neighbor. May we go and serve our neighbor. May we go flavor this world 
as we go in the name of the one who has called us, who has loved us, who has made us. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit.